Hi, so following up the last video, if you saw it, uh, I covered the paper about some thresholding issues in most of the software packages we typically use. And one of the outcomes of that paper was, well, first of all, doing things like specifying a cluster forming threshold of say 2.3, and then simply saying, oh, a 10 voxel extent, that was by far the worst. Um, and uh, secondly, of all the methods that were covered, the non-parametric methods uh, seem to control the type one error the best. So I figured I would follow that up with how to actually implement a non-parametric thresholding strategy. And I'm gonna focus on using the randomize function in the FSL software package. Um, it's just what I'm familiar with and all you need is a 40 nifty file. So you can use it regardless of what you use to process the rest of your data, as long as you have a nifty file you can use. Randomize. So what and why, um, if, if you haven't been watching, um, you can use non-parametric permutation tests to rely on your data to create your null distribution instead of assuming a parametric null. And I just was talking about the Eklund paper, uh, which it looks like a lot of you watched the video, which is great, which went over some of the um, problems with some of the commonly used thresholding strategies we use. So if you haven't seen those videos, you can click here to go to the non-parametric hypothesis testing overview. There are other related videos. And you can also click here if you'd like to see that paper overview. And I highly recommend you do this, um, or at least page through this paper, really important message. And the strategy that I will specifically be focusing on, I said I'll be using randomize, but there are um, actually three different uh, non-parametric strategies you can use through randomize, uh, cluster mass, cluster extent, and the threshold-free cluster enhancement, or TFCE. So if you want to know more about that, you can click here and have a look at that video. It's an overview of the paper that was published in 2009 that goes along with it. All right. So I'm gonna start simple. I think if I go through a one sample t-test and a two sample t-test, that should have you well on your way to um, using randomize. So the one sample t-test is nice. It's a, there's a little shortcut. And the two sample t-test requires you set up a design matrix and a contrast file. So I will show you how to do that using the GLM GUI. So what is randomize? What do you need? Uh, it's a command line tool that's part of FSL, so if you're Uncomfortable with the command line? Well, first of all, I can assure you, um, you you'll be fine. Um, you, can, you can do it. It's only a couple of lines of code. And if you are generally uncomfortable with command line stuff, I can't stress enough, just force yourself to do it and you'll eventually become comfortable with it and your life will eventually get much, much easier. The ingredients for a randomized analysis, you need a 4D nifty file. So this would be your group level data and it does have to be in nifty format. And for designs other than a one sample t-test, you're gonna need at least two additional files. One is a design matrix file, and the other is the contrast file. And you can use a GUI to create these. There's some special header information in the file um, that FSL will expect to be there, I think. I don't, I don't know what happens if you omit the header information, but if you use the GLM GUI, as I will show, it'll just generate these for you. Okay, and there are user guides and design guides. So these links will be in the info box um, below, in the YouTube info box. There's this um, FSL wiki that goes through uh, randomized, generally, it's just the randomized user guides. So I highly recommend reading through that. They have all sorts of information there. And then there's this basic GLM page. So the GLM page works for both randomized and standard feet design setups. Um, and they actually break it down into the feet instructions and the randomized instructions and cover just about everything. Uh, I can show you really quickly. So this is the randomized help page. So they have all sorts of things there, but this GLM whoop, page, this has tons of designs, just about anything you could think of, ANOVAs, all sorts of things. So if you ever get stuck, on setting up a design matrix, this GLM page should be your first stop. So bookmark it. All right, let's get to it. Here's the basic call structure. If you wanna see um, the help in FSL, let me go to the um, uh, command line here. 
All you have to do is type in the function name and hit return. You don't have to put a, you don't have to do this. You don't have to put a dash H. You just put the name. And it is randomized with an S, not a Z, Americans. I'm an American too, so. Um, so you just do that and it spits out all the help. So here's the basic call. Um, but then there are all these other goodies in here, which I'm not gonna go through. I'll just tell you the ones that we need for today. But if you want more information, that's how you get it. So here's the basic call structure, randomize, minus I, and then you put the input 4D file. And of course, these little greater than less than signs are not necessary. This is just telling you to type a file. Minus O, this is the output root name, all your output files. Minus D, the design.mat file, if necessary. For the one sample t-test, there's a shortcut. Minus T and then the design.con file. This contains the contrasts and I will create some of these for you later. I'll show you how to create them and then I'll show you what they look like. Minus M and then your mask image. So you can either use a whole brain mask or a region of interest mask. Um, just be careful how you do that. Don't double dip. Minus N, the minus is here. The N is here. Uh, 500, this is for 500 permutation samples. I, I wouldn't, I would go Go bigger. I would probably start with a thousand. Um, if you see something promising, then uh, for publication, I would do five thousand. Uh, minus D, this thing I'll talk about in a second. And minus T is for TFCE, the threshold free cluster enhancement. This D, I, I really, I really like the people who've created this software, but I find this to be really confusing, and I think it has caused a lot of confusion. The minus D serves the purpose of mean centering, um, and it used to just be mean centering, I think, the data. But now, in the, the most recent versions of FSL, it will mean center the data and the design matrix, as long as your design matrix is in a column of ones. Why? Um, it, it basically, if you just put a column of ones in your design matrix, it takes care of all that for you. Um, um, otherwise, this is a shortcut to get around having to put a column of ones in the design matrix. Quite frankly, just set up your design matrix correctly and you can skip the minus D. In other words, if you're modeling, if you're modeling a continuous variable, say age, you can either model it with a column of ones and then your age values and skip the minus D, or you can just put age, skip the column of ones and put the minus D. I don't know, I like to work with design matrices that are consistent, whether I'm using randomize or if I'm just using feet or if I'm just using any old statistics software package. Um, so I typically skip this minus D. Okay, and sometimes this minus V and then um, a full with half maximum is added. This is a variance smoothing step. I did discuss this when I went over the non-parametric methods uh, when I talked about thresholding in an earlier talk. Um, variant smoothing helps boost your power. The STD is in millimeters. Uh, so if you do minus V5, this implies a five millimeter full width half maximum smoothing. And they suggest that this could help for sample sizes less than 20. So the example I'm doing, I'm using here, I think I had like 70 subjects, so I'm not going to be using it, but I invite you to use it for your smaller sample sizes. Okay, let's start with the one sample t-test. This is the easiest one to run. So I'm gonna go back to here. Now, if we look in the help, uh, there's this minus one flag, and you can see that this performs a one sample group mean test instead of a generic permutation test. So this basically means that instead of creating a design matrix and a design contrast and putting these two flags here, you simply put a minus one. So let me show you what I have here. Um, here are my 4D, there are a lot of files here. This is the one I'm gonna be using here, this filtered funk data. It's from a, a group analysis. Um, it has, if you use FSL NVALs, it'll tell you how many time points you have. It has, not time points, but how many dimensions in the fourth dimension, or how many images in the fourth dimension. I have 71, so I have 71 subjects in this group analysis. I am going to run a one sample t-test. I'm going to put the output here, and since randomize, it does take some time to run. I think a thousand simulations here for one um, contrast estimate took, oh, I don't know, five to 10 minutes, we'll say. Um, 
There are ways to parallelize it. Uh, it depends on what type of grid you're using. So the grid I have access to is simply, a, you know, you do it yourself. Uh, you parallelize it yourself. If you're using a sun grid engine, um, that can parallelize a randomized job. Long ago, I had a computing system like that. It was pretty sweet. A randomized job ran really quickly. Anyhow, this is where I'm going to put my output, and I will show you what the command looks like. So this, I'll also have a link to this text file. I called it permcode.sh. It's not technically a shell script. It's just where I put my calls. Oh, so maybe that's sloppy. Um, okay, so here's the call. Let me make my window a little wider. Oh, yeah, I'm um, connecting remotely. So this is going to be a little slow. Okay, so randomize minus I filtered func data. So that's you can skip the .nii.gz, so I could put this. It'll run. You don't need it. FSL will fill in the blank. I have a mask file here. It's just a brain mask um, for whole brain. Minus O, so my output's going to go in this one samp t directory. It will be called greater than zero because I'm just running. It's a one-sided test, and it will be testing greater than zero. I put the minus one because it's a one sample t-test, minus capital T because it's TFCE, and I ran a thousand simulations. So if you start this, it will, I'm not going to now because I'm not going to wait while it runs, but it will start uh, spitting out output and it will tell you which permutation it's on. A really common error you'll get, especially, and this will only occur if you have small sample sizes, is you'll put something like 1,000 or 5,000. It'll run like, uh, I don't know, maybe 500, 12, whatever, it'll run a smaller amount of permutations and it'll be like, oh, that's all I can do. Um, that's just because there are only that many permutations possible with your data. So if you have small sample sizes, uh, permutation tests are at a disadvantage because there aren't many ways to permute the data. So that's a really common error that you'll get. Otherwise, um, yeah, I can't think of other common ones I see. So I'll show you what the output looks like. So I'm gonna go to this directory Okay, so there are two things here. I did greater than zero, and later I did less than zero. I'll show you that in a second. So I have two images here. There's this core P uh, T stat one. This is that stands for corrected P, not correlation P or something like that, but corrected P value. And then there's a raw T stat. If you go to the randomized help, it alludes that it gives an uncorrected P value as well, but that is no longer output. I'm unsure why, um, I'm just gonna make a guess. So my wild guess is that it doesn't do it anymore because uh, for TFCE, I don't know that we even know what the distribution is unless we do a permutation test. So um, yeah, if you need an uncorrected p-value, just rely on, uh, you can compute it yourself based on your t-stat. Anyhow, uh, so let's have a look at this because what's interesting and what's really important, and I can't stress this enough, this is not a p-value, it's a 1 minus p-value. There's 0, t, s, c, e. I'm going to open this in FSL view. I'm only going to open one of these in FSL view, and I will say I cheated and picked something I knew was going to give really robust activation um, for this one. I can throw my standard on here. If you go to add standard, because these were all registered to MNI 152. I don't know why I always have a hard time finding it. Here. There we go. And I know it goes outside of the brain. That's fine. Okay, so this is a 1 minus p value image because in FSL, let's set the max to 1. To do a threshold at point. 05, I would set the min to 0.95 and the max to 1. Let's make my activation red, yellow. There we go. And that's simply because um, you can only set lower bound thresholds. So the reason why 1 minus p values are output is because when viewing an FSL view, um, we can only set lower bound thresholds. We can't put less than 0.05, it won't display it correctly. So that's all it is. So if I click around here, this 0.999 means that my p-value is 0 0.001. Okay, so that's all we got. And we ran a thousand simulations. So the smallest p-value I can have is one out of a thousand, um, right? So that's what we're seeing, 0.999.
All right, so that's what it looks like. If you want to do a different threshold, you can increase this. Uh, mine's not going to change very much because this is such a robust uh, thing. Uh, so maybe it wasn't the greatest example, but you get the idea. Uh, okay. Now, let's say that was greater than zero. If I wanna see less than zero, the easiest way to do that is simply multiply your data by negative one first. So you can do that using the FSL maths command. Take my data, I multiply it by negative one, and I call that negative filtered func data, and then I use randomize, minus i, I use a negative input, and same mask, output I'm gonna call less zero, Everything else is the same. So all you have to do is multiply your data times negative one first and then repeat the same command and you get the one sample t-test in the opposite direction. Okay, so that is the one sample t-test. That's easy to run. The two sample t-test, you use GLM if you're in Linux. If you're not in Linux, if you're on a Mac, you use GLM underscore GUI to create your own design matrix. So I will open that. I'm on Linux, so I'll use GLM. All right, give you a couple of tips, especially if you're using a slow connection like I am. Uh, this thing's gonna take forever to load. So it's currently set on time series design. So there's two windows. So the GLM setup, and then the GLM here. Um, its default is a time series design. I want to do a, um, the other one, which is higher level. Now, if I switch it to higher level with 100 time points, it's going to take forever to load. So the two sample t-test I'm doing is 20 subjects in each group. So I have 40 time points. And now I'm gonna change it. If I leave it at 100 and change it, you're gonna be sitting here forever while this window loads with 100 entries. And if, if there's one thing, you need to be patient with this GUI. If you start clicking around, it just makes things worse. So I change this to higher level time series design. And even this is still gonna take a while. But I sit here patiently, patiently wait. Okay, I'll talk about this group column. This is not part of the design matrix. Um, it is used differently in randomized than it is in a standard feed analysis. And randomized, it, des it describes um, exchangeability blocks. And I'll talk about that with a paired t-test in a second. My, I'm gonna have two EVs. So I have two groups, and here's the easy way, easiest way to do this, especially if you have um, a large design matrix. And this is pretty large because I have 40 entries, and you can see how um, long this takes. So hit this paste button, and again, be patient. Ah, I'm starting to lose my patience. All those little arrows load in. Okay, here's the paste window. So you can hit clear, and now what you can do is you can go to MATLAB, and I've already done this. I've created the design matrix here in MATLAB, and then I'm going to highlight it, copy and paste it. So I copy it. So um, this is MATLAB running on my local machine. This is a remote machine. So for me, right now it works. I just copied it to paste. I'm gonna do my um, the equivalent of a middle mouse button click in Linux, and it pastes it in there, and I can hit OK. Um, sometimes that won't work for you. A tip is, I don't know why, but if you first paste it into an editor and then recopy it and paste it into the paste window, that will work. So open Emacs, paste it into Emacs, copy it again, and then paste it into the paste window. And then you can see we have our design matrix here. And then you go back to this other window and you hit save and you give it a name and it creates some files. So I've already done this. I will show you that quickly. Okay, here it is. So it created, I called it desmat. So I'll show you all the files it created. Desmat.con, desmat.fsf, desmat.group, desmat.mat, and then a P two PNGs and a PM, uh, PPM file. We only need this desmat.con. Oh, I forgot to show you that and I'm not reopening the window. It was in the other tab. And to do a two sample t-test, I would need the one minus one contrast and the minus one one. Um, hopefully you've used FSL before. Yeah, now I gotta open it. I'll open it slowly. Uh, pressure is on. Well, while that's opening, I'll still explain this. 
Ignore the header stuff, uh, it doesn't matter. Okay, let's do this. Let's make this 10. Let's change this to higher level. Okay, so if I click on this contrast and F-test window, actually let's make this two EVs, or tab, it's not a window. Ah, so this is where you set it. Two contrasts, and I would have done one minus one and minus one, one. That's all, and then I would have saved it. Okay, now I'm really done with that. So that's what this file looks like. So you could make this from, from scratch if you wanted to. Um, again, I'm not totally sure if you need to add all this header information before the actual numbers. And the um, design.mat, I'll get it right one of these times. It looks like this. So it's similar. It has these the same type of header information and then the actual design matrix. Okay, so once you have those two files, in this case just those two, the call looks like this. The input data, it's a different data set here, two sample data, the output, the design.mat, the contrast, which is a minus T, not a minus C, minus big T, because I'm using TFCE, minus N, 1,000. Again, for publication purposes, I would do 5,000, but you can start with 1,000 to see if you have anything. It takes one-fifth the amount of time. And see if you have anything within your threshold. So I've already run this here, and that's what the output here. Ah, so notice I now have two files, tstat1 and tstat2. That's because I ran two contrasts. So this is the one minus one contrast, which, which would correspond to group A being larger than group B. A was my first group. And this is the minus one, uh, one contrast, which would be the opposite. So... Um, right, so there are two of them. So a shortcut, if you don't feel like opening your file or you have a bunch of files to check, what you can do is simply run this FSL, oh, that doesn't seem right. Uh, check to see if anything within threshold. Mm, I don't think that should be FSL maths. Hold on. Right, it should be FSL stats. Little error here. This will be correct if you get the file. So if I do FSL stats and the name of my corrected p value in the minus big R, that's going to give me minus big R is the min to max. So my smallest one minus p value is zero, <laughs> and the largest one minus p value is 0 0.06. So this, this doesn't look good, right? There's nothing in this image. You might be thinking, oh, there's something between zero and 0 0.06, but in fact, uh, 0 0.06. 6 is not good here because this is 1 minus a p-value. We want numbers larger than 0.95. And if you want to know how many are above your significance threshold, um, you can use this command. This will give me a big fat 0 here. So this is setting a lower bound of 0.95, and minus v is the output voxels and volume. So this will be the number of voxels. So I have a big fat 0. So that's a shortcut for testing that. Okay. What about this group column? So as I said, it's used to describe its exchangeability blocks. It's not part of the design matrix. In a regular feed analysis, it's used for a different purpose. So one place this comes into play is a paired t-test because you don't want to permute your data across subjects, only within subject. Um, a quick note about the paired t-test, I prefer simply creating a within subject difference data first and running a one sample t-test on the result. As you just saw, setting up the design matrix for a one sample t-test, super easy. The paired t-test design is more complicated. And for me, I'm pretty comfortable with FSL maths, which is what you can use to create the difference images. So it usually takes me a couple seconds to do that. As opposed to setting up the paired t-test design matrix, which looks like this. You have the difference column. There is a whole video on this too. So look for the paired t-test design um, video, and then you have a mean for each subject. So the group column would look like this. So this is saying only exchange things with the same number. These, the values of these numbers are meaningless, other than only this entry here will be swapped with this as the permutation, permutations are created, and this entry will be swapped with the other two. 
Um, so for me, I think this is a lot more tricky to set up and I don't think there's a paste option for the design.group column. So like I said, I just do it by hand. I do the differencing and then use that minus one and I don't even have to make a design.mat, design.con, design.group file. So that is it. It was a little long, but hopefully it was helpful. Um, thank you very much for your time and your attention. Please join the Facebook group or follow on Tumblr or follow me on Twitter at MomBrainStats or all three. And I hope you have a really good day. Thanks.